Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Conservation Conversations. My name is Ed Pritchard, and I work for Miami Eco Adventures, a division of Miami Dade Parks. Uh, this webinar series, uh, Conservation Conversations, is a joint effort between UF IFAS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, and Miami Eco Adventures. So it's great to see some of our returning participants. And for those that are new to our webinar series, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're happy to continue providing these monthly webinars, which we started back in 2020, and we cover quite a range of environmental topics. And we have some great speakers lined up this spring. Uh, everyone in this uh, webinar is currently muted, so I ask that you type any questions that you might have that come up during the talk, uh, type those into the chat box, and I will go ahead and moderate that. We will answer any questions that you have at the end of the session. Uh, a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will be sending the link to the recording in the next few days. So feel free to share that link with others uh, and those that weren't able to join us. If you uh, enjoy these webinars, please follow us on social media at Miami Eco Adventures and at Miami Dade Sea Grant. And if you'd wanna receive an email with the upcoming topics, which we have through uh, May, uh, Anna will go ahead and put her email in the chat right now and you can reach out to her there. So without further ado, go ahead, settle in on the couch, prep or you know, eat your dinner and listen in on this great presentation that we have in store for you tonight from Anna Zangronis. Anna, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Ed. Thanks everybody for joining us. As Ed mentioned, my name is Anna Zangronis and I'm the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent here in Miami-Dade County. And Ed and I have been collaborating on this webinar series for close to two years now. So we're really happy to continue it and meet new people throughout the county, throughout Florida, and even the rest of the country. And we even have a couple of international attendees as well. So it's been a great way to get to know more members of our community. Before we get too thick into the weeds of horseshoe crab information, we're going to start out with a really simple poll, and I'm going to ask Ed to launch the poll. It should pop up on your screen, and you can use your mouse to select what answer you think is best. I'm going to read these for you also. Number one, horseshoe crabs are dangerous, true or false. Number two, horseshoe crabs are critical to local ecology, the fishing industry, biomedical operations, or all of the above. And lastly, number three, horseshoe crabs are true crabs, true or false. Man, I love this. We have a great amount of participation. Thank you, everybody. When you've made your selections, please hit submit at the bottom, and then Ed will give it maybe 10 or 20 more seconds and we'll move on. Thank you for right, participating, everyone. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go over those answers at, towards the end of the presentation. So there is a lot of information about horseshoe crabs and we're gonna start first with discussing their biology. And the first part of this is there, there's so many questions. So we're gonna, I'm gonna try to highlight some of the most commonly asked or commonly encountered things that you might wonder. And there's so many things. First of all, horseshoe crabs are not true crabs. They are not crustaceans. They are actually arthropods, which makes them more closely related to scorpions and spiders which is pretty interesting. And that's part of what, if some people know this, what sometimes gives them pause or concern when considering if whether or not these animals are a danger to us. And generally speaking, many folks, myself included, don't tend to like things that have a lot of legs. So, but rest assured, these are very safe creatures, although they are not true crabs. And our specific that we have here in the Atlantic and Florida is Limulus polyphemus. A lot of folks ask questions wondering whether or not these are ancient. And you might have heard that horseshoe crabs are living fossils. And that's because the lineage of the horseshoe crab is very, very old. 
the lineage of these creatures came to be in roughly the Paleozoic era, and this lineage has remained more or less intact ever since. The closest relatives are now some extinct marine animals like Eurypteids or sea scorpions. So that makes this lineage, it survived over millions of years, including many mass extinctions. We have four horseshoe crab species that are still present today, three closely related Asian species, and then our Limulus, which has been on its own path since the Jurassic era. These horseshoe crabs, they, they look like little tanks. If you were to look at them when they are right side up and you see that U-shaped or horseshoe-shaped outer shell. But they have a very stable body plan and a lot of many so-called primitive, and I say primitive with air quotes around them, traits. And primitive traits simply means that these are traits that are similar to those found in the stem answers of ancestors of horseshoe crabs. And that's why they get the nickname of living fossils. They have a lot of similar traits like those of those ancient ancestors. And one of these is their gill structure. And this is very unlike other marine arthropods. The gill structure of horseshoe crabs are referred to as book gills. And they get that as if you, if you can direct your attention to the photograph on the right, you could flip through them almost as though you were flipping through pages of a book. And this is actually quite more similar to gills of arachnids than those of crabs. And they breathe by taking in water through the channels of their gills and then circulating it, which is pretty neat. Here is one of the questions from the quiz. And this is where there's a lot of differing opinions. And the, the question is, are horseshoe crabs dangerous? And the answer is no. They do have that spiky looking tail or their telson, but that is not used to sting or stab. It's simply intended for the crab to be able to turn itself over if it were to get flipped. For example, if it were caught in major wave action. And so that tail is really important because horseshoe crabs can be easily overturned due to lots of wave movement. And most crabs that are stranded are capable of righting themselves, but some can't. And in this picture that you see on the right side of your screen, this is an example of a pretty large stranding event fo following a horseshoe crab spawning. And they use their telson or that tail to right themselves either by bending backwards and sticking their telson into the sand and lever themselves over, or they work their tail into the sand and sit up. And if their tail is broken or short, or if the muscle that moves in the tail is damaged, they can't right themselves and they are likely to either be predated upon or dry out and die. And so that's why it's really important if you were to see a horseshoe crab upside down, as there are in the photos, this photo on the beach, you handle it by the sides of its outer shell to turn it over, not by trying to flip it over using its tail. Horseshoe crabs have eyes. They do have eyes and they can see us. Even though they look like these strange little tank organisms, they are covered with sensory receptors. They have these lateral eyes that are capable of seeing objects pretty well, both at night and during the day. Additionally, they have two median eyes that can sense visible and ultraviolet light on the front area of the shell, which is, where's my mouse? Right here for the shell is called the prosoma. And they also have light sensitive eyes underneath the body and on the tail or the telson. And between all of these things, their eyes and other sensory receptors, all of these structures allow them to feel and smell and taste their environment. So 
some of you may be familiar with why would a horseshoe crab, why a horseshoe crab would come up onto the beach? Are they doing what we think they're doing? And the answer is yes. <laughs> if you see a pair of horseshoe crabs, that is a latched pair that is in the process of spawning. And their reproduction is one of the most peculiar things about them. In many ways, the nesting and mating behavior of Limulus polyphemus is unique among, moder among modern invertebrates. The crabs come ashore in attached pairs. The female crab will bury herself in the sand and lay several thousand eggs in a bunch, then moves forward and lays another clutch. The female lays the eggs and the male fertilizes those eggs externally with aquatic free swimming sperm. This external fertilization and free swimming sperm is unlike any other arthropod, but probably like that of their primitive stem ancestors. And it's, you can think of it, what other marine invertebrate walks up onto shore to lay its eggs or digs a nest the way a sea turtle does. That's pretty unique. These animals nest at spring high tides. And these are the peak high tides of the month, which are directly related to the new and full moons. The high tides puts their eggs in the right zone for success. And that has largely to do with the available levels of oxygen in the sand, as well as the temperature. So eggs laid in an area that's too low are likely gonna to be too cold with not enough oxygen for the eggs to survive. And on the other end of the spectrum, eggs laid in the sand that are too high are likely gonna to be too hot and dry to be viable. These crabs have a pretty long lifespan. They can live up to 20 years. And the juveniles, they're, they're, these guys, I mean, they're almost like little, they've been referred to, I heard my colleague refer the, to them today as little ocean hoovers, those little automated robot vacuum cleaners because they just scuttle along the bottom and eat whatever they think is suitable. So that ranges from the juvenile crabs eating polychaete worms and mollusks to the adults eating other invertebrates and bottom dwelling fish. These crabs can molt or essentially shed that exoskeleton. They molt at least once a year, if not twice, and continue molting until they reach reproductive maturity. I know I've experienced this walking on certain areas, walking around certain beaches in Miami when I spotted a molt on the beach. And these are often confused with actual crabs, but in fact, they are just that no longer needed outer shell that you see that's left behind. And so they keep growing and they keep molting until they reach reproductive maturity. One thing, another thing I wanna mention that makes the horseshoe crabs different than true crustaceans is that true crustaceans, once they molt, they back out of their shell. Whereas as you can see here, when the horseshoe crab molts, it exits moving forward, leaving a little split on the front of the molt. So that's another good way to identify a molt from a living active crab. Once those adults reach reproductive maturity, they stop molting and they can continue living for another six to eight years. So they have that final molt when they mature and they begin reproducing. And because of that final molt, their shell deteriorates very gradually as they grow older. And this is the main mechanism that we use to help determine the crab's age. Now we don't go as far as to say, this crab is one year old or three years old or nine years old. We categorize them into three age classes. And we're looking specifically at young or recently molted crabs, which are gonna be a little shinier, you know, a little more bling bling. It's gonna have that fresh wax and new car smell versus a medium age, which is gonna start looking a lot more dark and thick and have some pitting on it compared to an older crab, which is gonna have more biofouling or aquatic organisms like barnacles and algae 
and that shell is going to be really thick and dark. And so that's how we categorize them into these age classes. We're looking for young, medium, or old. So the shell condition is really critical to estimating that age. And I just wanted to point out, it's a picture I took last spring of a friend of mine and I, we were kayaking up in St. Augustine and we found this dead crab. I actually saw it because it was head down in the water with its telson sticking up. And we knew very quickly that it was dead because it smelled horrible. So we picked it up just to make sure that it was okay, took a picture and then let it be free. But you can see just how pretty substantially large this crab is in relation to my friend. This is a pretty old and pretty large crab. Now from a biomedical standpoint, horse crabs are super cool. They have blue blood, which is because their blood is copper-based, which is different than ours, which is iron-based. And it's not the color of the blood that makes them special. Rather, it's the blood has particular blood cells that are very sensitive to the presence of gram-negative bacteria. And so what does that mean? Well, essentially, if you've ever gotten a shot, had an operation or received some sort of implant, then horseshoe crabs have touched your life through the seven degrees of separation of Kevin Bacon. Because this compound, when these horseshoe crabs are processed for the biomedical industry, they have their blood removed. And from there, their blood is spun down and these special blood cells called amoebocytes are removed and those cells are used to create a chemical called limulus amoebocyte lysate. And that compound is what is used in the biomedical industry for testing the sterilization factor for any sort of medical procedure. So this is a very big deal. This is pretty incredible. It's a pretty incredible technology. And these crabs are, this is very highly regulated. Of course, these crabs are collected they can lose, they can be drained or bled of about a third of their blood. And then from that point, they are tagged and released back into the wild. And there is roughly a 15 to 30% mortality rate. But what that means is that it's roughly a 70 to 85% survival rate of these crabs that are bled and then re-released. Right now, there are roughly, I think, five companies in the U.S. who collect the blood and sell it. Florida is not one of those. Florida does not have any biomedical operations as of yet. You can see here from the statistic that one pint of this blood can come up to with a price tag of up to $15,000, which is pretty, it's pretty pricey, but certainly something to keep in mind when we consider all of the medicine that happens here, not only in the United States, but in other countries. And that brings us to why would anyone want to study these creatures? They're weird looking. They're really, really old. Clearly, they've been around for millions of years. Well, there's a bunch of different reasons, and they can be traced to three, three main types, and that's the three Bs, birds, bait, and biomedical. We just talked about the biomedical aspects, the use of that blood compound to make the limulus amoebocyte lysate. But also, the eggs of horseshoe crabs are an important food source for migrating shorebirds. In addition to the crabs themselves eating other things in the ocean and other things eating the crabs, that, those eggs are really important. And there have been studies shown, showing that the loss of horseshoe crab populations and therefore less eggs have actually been linked with shorebird populations going down. So those, those food sources are really important and the horseshoe crabs play a critical role in a marine food chain. And then lastly, from an economic standpoint, horseshoe crabs are important in the fishing industry. They are fish to use for bait for commercial fisheries as well as they are important in the aqua, excuse me, not aquaculture, aquaria. They are important in the aquarium industry. They are targeted, usually the babies, 
for use in people's personal aquariums. So additionally, I, I think I touched upon the ecological, but there was one thing I forgot and wanted to mention is that as these little hoovers scuttle around the ocean floor, they disturb and aerate the seafloor with the way that they feed. They, they almost plow through the sediment when they search for clams and worms. And that's called bioturbation. So by bioturbating the sediments, they help to enhance species diversity and oxygenate the sediment. And so because there's just not a lot of data on this species historically, Right now, there really isn't a great population assessment in the state of Florida, and there is a federal mandate to study these species very, very closely. It's thought that there are up to five distinct subpopulations of Limulus polyphemus within Florida, and that's closely linked to the particular geographic region of the state. Unfortunately, horseshoe crabs are exploited in Florida. And in the bottom right photo, you can see the little, little baby horseshoe crabs that are so cute. And that is what, those are what are targeted for both bait operations and aquarium trade. Something I'd like to bring your attention to is this graph, which shows pretty closely how the collections, it's a little tough to see, but these collections of horseshoe crabs peaked in Florida in the early 2000s and then started dropping down. And I want to bring your attention to that because that was around the time that regulations went into play in other states. So people from Georgia and north of Georgia were coming to Florida to fish for horseshoe crabs, which is why there was such a huge spike in those populations. Fortunately, our regulations started becoming a little bit more stable after that. So you can see that this line has flattened out a little bit. In addition to being targeted for bait and aquaria, as I mentioned here in Florida, there are no bleeding operations or biomedical operations, not yet. And unfortunately, there are there is an accidental or incidental take involved with horseshoe crabs accidentally getting sucked into intakes for power plants. So these are all things that make the species very vulnerable to overharvest. Enter Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch. I'm hoping that maybe some of you are familiar with this program. This is a citizen science volunteer program that was started by the University of Florida IFAS Nature Coast Biological Station, Florida Sea Grant, and Florida Fish and Wildlife back in 2015. And this was a project that was designed to start to get an idea of the local populations of the horseshoe crab within Florida. This program has a bunch of very specific goals. The first is to tag horseshoe crabs and perform spawning beach surveys to collect the data needed for estimating population size of horseshoe crabs in Florida. Also, establishing the population metrics such as size, sex ratio, breeding behavior, and mass or the weight of horseshoe crabs. We're also looking to determine environmental variables associated with spawning behavior, which could also lead to establishing habitat requirements and critical spawning beaches for crabs. And then the last component is public education both of the volunteers and others about horseshoe crabs with the goal of increasing public participation and investment. As one might imagine, a program like this has a lot of moving parts that is largely in the coordination of the volunteers, but also purchasing the different parts of the gear that are needed for the surveys, distributing and storing that gear, making sure that there are sufficient amount of tags, making sure that the regulatory components or permitting are all completely in compliance. And then of course, obtaining the data sheets and making sure that the data entry is smooth. 
there are a lot of resources available for Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch. And I will tell you that the survey locations, so this involves visiting certain sites within specific areas where there have been reports of horseshoe crabs in the past. And that is happening in line with those peak anticipated spawning events. Horseshoe crabs do spawn year round and they differ slightly. There's a little bit of variability in when and that's largely due to the geographic region. So North versus South of the state, there are very different environmental conditions in those areas. And when possible, we're looking for hot spots. But again, that will fluctuate depending on where people are. The main component of this is that beach nesting survey, which involves walking a length of beach, starting right at the peak predicted high tide during the daytime. There is no surveying done at night, just logistically. It's a little challenging. Some of the areas we don't have access to at night, plus the safety of all of the participants is at the forefront of this program. These volunteers, they work in pairs, recording the number of horseshoe crabs observed nesting on the beach or just offshore. And you're noting whether they are individuals, paired, excuse me, paired horseshoe crabs, unpaired males, unpaired males in physical contact or satellite males, unpaired females, and the numbers of each. And this is something, should you choose to participate in this program, this is something that you will learn in far more detail at a training event. As part of that beach nesting survey, you are also looking for horseshoe crabs that are tagged. And so in doing that, you are looking for this little tag that'll be on the left side of the shell or the persoma and marking down that tag number. And this is, this is what's referred to as a mark recapture study. And this allows for the best possible data collection to help estimate population size. The final component of Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch involves collecting specimens, measuring the width of their prosoma, their mass or their weight, and then also applying a tag. And these tags are coded by size. The females get a larger tag and the males get the smaller tag. So these are all skills every volunteer is walked through and checked out on before leaving their training event. Since this program launched, we're at just shy of seven years, there's just unbelievable amounts of data that have been captured already. And some of the ones I wanna highlight were that over 800 volunteers have donated time, more than 10,000 hours, almost 200,000 driving miles, and tagged 8,500 crabs, which is really cool. And you can see here that the education amounts, and this simply referring to while out on survey, giving people information about what they're doing, why it's important and about the crabs themselves. So that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. And already there's been quite a lot of conclusions made about the horseshoe crab movements in Florida. Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch originated in the Nature Coast, which is roughly here, the Bend area on the Gulf Coast. And it has since expanded to other locations around the state. So you can see that Southeast Florida has had a pretty large gap. And right now, the closest county that has Horseshoe Crab Watch is Collier. And then to our north, Martin County. And there, Monroe County does have Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch. But right now, within four counties north of Monroe, my Miami-Dade is gonna be the first. So we're really excited to say that this is, this is coming, so stay tuned. Something else that's pretty notable about the program that I'd like to mention is that after this program was up and running for a few years, the individuals who helped get this program off the ground did a study and analyzed the data collected by the volunteers against data collected by that of uh, excuse me, professional scientists. 
And they were able to demonstrate that the volunteers who collected data were producing, capturing data that was statistically similar to that collected by the professional working scientists. And that speaks to the efficacy and power of citizen science initiatives to really help collect this important research that will later be used to help inform management and policy decisions. So if surveying for horseshoe crabs is not really, walking on the beach is not really your jam, that's okay. Reporting tagged horseshoe crabs, whether it's where you live or another part of the state where you're visiting is really helpful. And that's simply, if you see a crab with a tag on it, report it. And likewise, if you see a crab that doesn't have a tag on it, report it. There are ways to do this on FWC's site. It is a different website if it's a tagged crab, but every single piece of data is critical into helping establish spawning survey sites, as well as going into that database to help us understand where the crabs are going and when. As I just alluded to, Linked with Limulus is finally launching in Miami-Dade County. This has been something years in the making. I'm pleased to say that I will be serving as the volunteer coordinator for this program here in Miami-Dade. And we are having our first training event this Saturday at Crandon Park. I'm going to ask Ed to throw the link to the registration into the chat box. It's $5 to participate. And this is our first training event. We're really looking to try and get a nice, a really well-trained group ready to go to start surveying in March and April for the spring season. And if you're not able to join this Saturday, please don't despair. The training materials do exist in an online format. And if that is something people are interested in, you can let me know in the chat box or connect with me afterward because I will likely be doing another in-person practical training later this season and definitely before the fall anticipated spawning season. So we're looking to get a really good group, solid individuals to help fill all those different times of the peak high tides to do these surveys. So if this sounds like something that might interest you, please reach out. Lastly, we're gonna close with the same three questions that we started with at the beginning. Ed is launching the poll as we speak and I will read the questions aloud one more time. So please use your mouse to make your selections. True or false, horseshoe crabs are dangerous. Number two, horseshoe crabs are critical to local ecology, the fishing industry, biomedical operations, or all of the above. Number three, true or false, horseshoe crabs are true crabs. And lastly, number four, this was not present in the beginning. Number four, do you intend to apply or share the information that you've learned today? So we'll give that another few more seconds. And then we'll, add, we'll ask Ed to, I'll ask Ed to close it and share the results. I'm hopeful that most of you got at least one more right the second time around versus the first time. Looks like we got everyone. Thank you all for participating. Oh, awesome, thanks. Ed, could you share the results? Fantastic. Sure. All right, number one, horseshoe crabs are dangerous. The answer is false, well done. Horseshoe, oh, did I skip one? Oh no, no, I missed one. Oops, well, okay, okay we'll right. skip over number three. <laughs> number two, horseshoe crabs are critical to all of the above. Yes, ecology, fishing, and biomedical. Number three that I forgot to put in the actual poll, horseshoe crabs are true crabs, that was false. But I'm just gonna imagine that everybody got that one 100% correct. All right, and so lastly, I would just like to say that I wanna give a personal thank you to my colleagues at WC and UF IFAS and Florida Sea Grant because they really, they made this happen, but none of this, 
none of these things happen in a vacuum. It, they require a lot of effort, a lot of partners, a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And so they certainly made it easier for me to step into this new role and start learning about these really cool little creatures. So I hope this has piqued your interest and whether you're in Miami-Dade or another county, maybe you'll consider participating in a Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch training. And if not, at the very least, report one of these crabs if you happen to see one when you're out walking on the beach. Thank you, everybody. Great, thank you so much, Anna, for that insightful presentation. And that's really exciting that we'll be, you know, kicking off that effort here in Miami-Dade County and get some folks out to, uh, to count our horseshoe crabs. Uh, so it's now a little after 6.30. So for those that have to leave, no worries, that's perfectly fine. We will stay on now to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, thank you again for tuning in to the webinar tonight. As a reminder, we're going to uh, send a link to the recording out in the next day or two so you can share this and uh, anyone that you know is interested in, in learning about these horseshoe crabs and maybe even participating, you can share that presentation with them. And uh, we hope you'll